all of my good days outweigh my bad days and die I won't complain have my roselle growing in this grow box here sitting on a platform so I don't have to bend down to weed or harvest and they are doing wonderful it's my first time growing them in this box I grew them in a raised bed last year and I just wanted to try something different and I am so happy that I put them in this grow box they are growing well they're flowering yeah so I would be able to harvest some of these roselle buds to make tea very soon. The ancient Greek considered sorrel as a magical herb because it was used a lot a long time ago to help treat a lot of illnesses and diseases such as rickets, sores in the mouth, kidney problems, high fevers, and even bladder problems. Sorrel has a lot of vitamins in it uh, and has a high content of vitamin C along with vitamin A. And it's really good if you want to add it to like your stir fry or your salads or maybe a dressing because it has a nice lemon flavor. So you don't have to just make tea out of it. Last year before I grew sorrel, I was doing a lot of research, you know, because uh, I'm a breast cancer survivor as well as I have polycystic kidneys. And I kept running across sorrel. So I purchased the seeds because studies show that the high vitamin C content will prevent breast cancer from metastasizing. And like I said, it helps with the kidneys. Here are some of my sunflowers. They're making a really good showing um, this spring. I started the seeds inside my home in January. And what I like about sunflowers is this. I like to... Uh, cut them and bring it in the house for a bouquet. And I used to eat sunflower seeds when I was a, a young child. Unfortunately, my grandchildren don't like them. I've even roasted them, added them with roasted peanuts and made peanut butter. They was excited the first time we did it because it was a good project. But other than that, I grow the sunflowers because they attract pollinators like birds also, every type of bee, whether there are honeybees or bumblebees, it's a lot of pollen in the center of the flower itself. It's like hundreds of thousands of little bitty florets that, that the bees will feed upon. So it's a good idea to have some sunflowers in your garden. Here's just a quick look at the progress of my green beans. They're bush type, so I don't need a trellis or anything on them. Same beans that I grew last year, I'll insert the type. And it's like, you know, they just keep on giving because you don't have to keep buying seeds over and over if you let some stay on the pod, let them dry out, and then put them up for the next year. Here's just a quick follow-up to um, the panty pan squash after I injected the tea inside of the squash. It's still going uh, blooming. And still got a few squash that I'm waiting to get a little bigger. However, I am probably going to pull it pretty soon because it's too hot. It's too hot. We're going to be at 100 degrees, I think 98 by tomorrow. And yeah, it's, it's just too hot, but the plant is still flourishing. Okay? Just to show you that it won't harm the plant if you inject it with B T in the stems or the base of the plant. It's looking pretty good, guys. Okay, just a little quick follow-up. Excuse me. This is the patty pan squash that I didn't inject. It's doing okay. I don't see any signs of uh, squash vine border in it yet. I'm still going to keep a close eye on it and spray it every, I don't know, every week. And I'll still let you know what happened. Here's uh, my blackberry plant. I bought it for $7 at Lowe's last year on clearance. It's called a Texas blackberry. 
and I'm gonna go in closer here so you can see that it's starting to uh, make the berries these little this little flower that turns into a really tight um, type of cone shape ball like right there then eventually they start opening up and getting bigger like that one right there and i noticed these were the first blooms so now they're beginning to form the berry and change colors and i'll follow up in the future and let you see um how they're doing because I have so much growing in my food forest, in order for me to prevent or retard powdery mildew as much as I can through, during our rainy season, I have to clear the bottom out spaces so that you can see and get air through everything, okay? So, I'm just surprised. I've seen it before, how when I remove the branches, the figs still keep coming anyway at the bottom, and that's cool. But you really need the leaves to help create photosynthesis for the figs and to protect them from the birds. So I may have to sacrifice these. The birds may get them, you know, before uh, I do. But that's okay because there are plenty of figs. I shape these so that they can be more like a hedge instead of a real big wide tree. I can't get down the pathway, okay? But uh, yeah, so if you remove leaves that doesn't necessarily mean that uh the figs won't continue to grow in that area but this is the deal this brown turkey fig tree in this position gets the worst fungus every year you can look at previous videos and it seems like this year we're almost through with the rainy period it ends in may and then we go into our drought period in garden zone 8a mesquite texas north texas yeah so yeah my idea to let airflow get through here uh-huh i think it's worked i don't think i know it's worked because i'll be spraying it for uh, for fungus by now and let me show you the brown turkey fig tree over here doing the same thing putting on a lot of figs and I, you all know I cut this down like crazy. This fig tree was real wide and it was extending all the way over here, stunning the growth. Let me get my arm out the way. Stunning the growth of the pear trees. So I built it up like a hedge and I air layered it and I also rooted some cuttings so that it can go, you know, horizontal instead of being so vertical. Yeah. Well, vertical and wide. So let me go close up and let you see these beautiful, beautiful. My grandkids love figs. Guys, I ate fig newtons as a kid. My mother would buy them. I didn't know where the figs in the fig newtons came from until I was grown. <laughs> that's the truth. Something that's very, very pretty. These are lilies that I purchased on the clearance section at Lowe's for a dollar a few years ago and they overwinter nicely just in the pots I didn't have to bring them in the greenhouse or anything and they're just doing really well and uh, I forgot the name of the lily I want to say Aztec I'll insert it I'll look at my journal and insert what it is but they're very very pretty and for a dollar you can find a plant that you know that's not all the way dead because it's going to come back. It's a perennial. I buy it. Okay? And it's amazing. I didn't buy anything this year. I didn't buy anything. Everything came back or most of it came back or I propagated like all this beautiful living mulch and fertilizer in this garden bed that has uh, two pear trees, one on regular stock and one on a dwarf stock. A few days ago, I uh, recognized that my chicory, which is a uh, Italian dandelion, was going to seed. It's producing a vine. And I started wrapping them on this trellis because I saw the, it had one flower. And as you can see here, all of these little 
buds are going to produce a flower and I'm trying to hold on to them by interwining them in uh, the openings of the trellis. It's a pretty flower. It didn't do that last year. It got too cold uh, before they could go to seed, but they did survive. And right over here, I'm doing the same thing on this side. As you can see, all of this will make pretty flowers. I'm going, and the, and the vines are kind of tough because sometimes you can't uh, manipulate the vines without them breaking, but they're pretty strong. Another thing I want to show you, when you see that yellowing in there, don't worry about it, it's running its course. This means that the morning glory, even though they're producing some pretty blooms, they're going to seed. Here's a pod here, 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 and then you can look. There's a couple over here. Now, this is the good part. Morning glories, you don't have to wait until the seed pods dry out to replant the seeds. They would just drop off and come up anywhere they fall. Or you could strategically pick them up out of your wood chips or your ground soil and place them where you want to go. I probably would pull the plants out of here, refreshen the potting mix in here and in here and plant those pods again. I, then I bring them into the greenhouse in the winter and have morning glories all year long. So when you see all that yellowing, they're just going to seed. Okay, see all those pods? It'll be a lot of seeds in there. And I'll show you what they look like again in another video. And I already have one, but I'll show you again. Here's a look at my citrus trees. I'm gonna go in closer, especially uh, with the one that I call my problem child. This one right here, the Meyer lemon. Now that's the sun coming uh, through there. Okay, shining down on this one. Uh, it looks like it's more yellow than what it is, but it's actually, let me see if I can take another view where the sun is not hitting it. It's greener. I think I told you guys I was gonna wait another month and see if I need to give it more chelated iron. It doesn't, the results, you don't get them overnight. So I haven't given it anything else. And you can see all of those uh, leaves that I pointed out. I'll probably insert a little piece of that video now, here's a little clip from a few weeks ago when I was sharing with you the yellowing of the leaves of this improved Meyer lemon and how it had the beginning of little bitty uh, leaves coming on the branches. And I uh, let you all know that I had been transplanting. That's why my nails was dirty. And um, I wasn't going to prune it because I my experience had taught me that they were going to, those leaves were going to grow back. And of course they did. Now you can see from the clip that I did today that they did indeed grow back and looking good. Those leaves are growing very well. All the citrus are doing well. All the citrus have something growing in them. Like this one, the grapefruit is growing, uh, lavender and marigolds. The petunias eventually died. And that happens when they're in full sun and it gets past 90 degrees. You can keep them if you shade them. And eventually I may have to shade some of the plants in this area, especially to the tomatoes, because they won't make any more blooms after 85, 90 degrees. And I'll bring that into you a uh, video and show you how I do it, okay? But yes, my improved Meyer lemon is doing very, very well. Here's an update on my lettuce that is growing in baskets. And you can see it's beginning to bolt. Uh, and we'll have seeds and I'm going to let it just do its thing because saving seeds is like printing your own money. And you can see here, this Merlot lettuce is getting ready to bolt and I'll harvest as much as I can today. And after that, I would just let it go to seed because when it starts to bolt, in my opinion only, lettuce tastes bitter. So yeah. I'm going to collect seeds for the fall from these two plants. Here are two of my beans in a basket. I only put three, sometimes four beans in each 
basket. They're doing really well. They'll start putting on beans, I would say, about next week. And then they will be um, big enough to uh, harvest in about three weeks. Beans in a basket. This beast right here is my mushroom basket tomato. I got the seeds from Baker Creek. I'm gonna zoom in closer so you can see it's still fruit on the vine. It's still blooming. Uh, but I don't know how much longer it's going to continue to bloom for the simple fact that we're uh, in the 90s now and the blooms uh, just usually fall off. However, I'm gonna go ahead and let it do its thing and um, see how much tomatoes I can get out of this humongous tomato plant. And you guys know that I pruned right in here where you see that yellowing, but it's just still keep growing. And the ironic thing about this is it was a very sick, weak plant that I almost put in the compost and something said, I'm gonna just plant it over here with the peppers. This is the bed that I told you guys I was gonna remove all the soil. Probably pay the landscaper unless I do a little bit at a time. Um, it has severe knotted root. I've been growing in this soil for what, 20 years? You know, adding fresh compost, worm castings, that type of thing. So I'm just letting it do whatever it wants to do for right now when it gets cooler in the fall of the year. I'm gonna take this bed, let me step back and let you see where this table is toward the edge of the greenhouse. I'm gonna flip this bed over here. In other words, it's going. this bed will be up against the edge with the cement blocks and this first row of cement blocks. And I'm gonna let all this area in here be a walkway where I can easily wheel my citrus trees and any other tropical plants or plants that I'm going to overwinter. So I didn't stop watering it because it, it's infested with and non-beneficial nematodes that eat on the roots of your plants and create a fungus and you get these knotty roots. I'll insert a picture and those are still the remnants of the tomato plants because you don't want to put those in your compost because you just be spraying the non-beneficial nematodes to your compost and when you put your compost in your beds, your planters, what have you, elevated raised garden beds, you just be spreading nematodes. But I am going to save the society garlic. I'm going to soak them in a solution of water and peroxide. Because peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, will rapidly degrade the internal tissue and kill the fungus as well as the nematodes. And yeah, so might as well just get rid of it. You know, how long can you keep growing in the same soil? It's just like no matter how much you destroy some, you still have them there and they keep multiplying. So it's time. Something else that contributed to the spread of these non-beneficial nematodes is the fact that I grow food all year long. So I never really completely rested the bed. And when you're heating up your greenhouse during the uh, winter, well, you just make the conditions favorable for that nematode to multiply. But what I'm really happy about is the fact that after I pulled almost everything up, stuff started growing. Like you can see here, it's beautiful. Here's, a, I think it's a beet. I'm sure it's a beet. Yep, let me pull it up. I'm gonna go ahead and have it for lunch. It's a golden beet. And this is a nice size one here. Can you see that? Beautiful golden beet. And look at those roots. So the nematodes were attacking this beet. See those little knots look like a string of pearls? That's when you know you got nematodes. And you're probably wondering, why don't you just put some killer or whatever in there? I have. I put milky spores, I put crushed crab legs, I planted the bed one year with just uh, marigolds that kill nematodes, but it was just too much in the soil. So, after examining both beets really well, you can see that knotted root is on both of them. So, I've been fighting it for like, what, seven years? Maybe eight years since I retired. It's time to get some new soil. This is my herb wheelbarrow, and it's doing so good, guys. You see deal in here. 
getting ready to do a bouquet. So that means they will go to seed. And I will collect those. I'll put a bag over it. Beautiful bouquet of dill here. And here I'll collect as much as I can. You can see the parsley is beginning to go to seed. You can see a flower right there. I'm going to harvest a lot of it and let it dry in a mesh bag where ants or anything can't get into it. And I'll just let it dry naturally on the patio. This is curly leaf parsley here. And this is flat leaf. Let me show you the difference. You see how the seeds are coming in here? These little uh, flowers, they're gonna get dark like right there and I'll be able to collect these seeds. There's a lot of basil in here. I mean, I'm gonna really have fun dehydrating this in the sun. And back here, I have sage. The sage is doing wonderful. I'll collect a little bit of it and dehydrate it. I'm pulling this back so you can really see. This is from last year. It was, it was only about this much that survived the winter, but look how it multiplied. So I'm going to uh, collect a lot of it. And then there was just a little rosemary, maybe about this much that survived. And this is growing here and it smells so good so aromatherapeutic with all of the different herbs especially the sage and the rosemary and the basil it's just absolutely delicious smelling okay so this was a gorilla card a large one and you can see i've got the red basil down here going to seed and i'm gonna collect those seeds too so I've been really blessed to grow a lot of things this year uh, from seeds that I've collected or seeds that people donated to me. Okay, I see a squash bug. I see it, I'm getting ready to get it. I'm on camera, I'm gonna get it. There it is. This is that squash vine border. This is what it looks like, it's a moth and it will lay eggs and then those eggs will bore into stems of food. I'm sorry to relocate him to the upper room on camera, but that's what I do. And if you know me, if you ever listened to me and heard my story, I was a twin, my twin died at birth and my parents had four boys ahead of me. So I was real spoiled. They were so happy to have a girl. And then they had another son a few years later and then my baby sister. And I was always spoiled and pampered and real dainty. I was squeamish. I never touched worms, bugs, anything, guys, because of the fact that I was a girly girl. Never picked up any tools or took garbage out, anything like that. The boys did that. But my mother did make the boys learn how to cook and iron. She said, because one day you'll have a wife, she'll have children, and when she's down recovering, then you're going to have to help her out. But I never took the trash out, never changed the light bulb, okay? I went from my mom's house to my husband's house, and he spoiled me again, and he did all the manly stuff. I, I, I uh, took on the role as a feminist. So when I started growing all these groceries in my backyard and learning and distinguishing uh, beneficial insects from bad in, uh, insects, I started grabbing them. And I just like I got this one right here, still alive, but he's going to be gone in a few minutes. So ladies, I hear a lot of you all say, oh, no, I can't take it. I can't stand worms. I can't stand blizzards. I can't. Well, when you start depending on your crops for your groceries, <laughs> you'll change slowly but surely you'll change just a few pearls from lady cheryl Bria and i are getting this order ready so that we can ship it and we always take pride in our orders right Bria? yes <laughs> okay bye everybody bye thanks for watching